Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of MedTech Insights from Asia. Today I'm really excited to have Adam Clark as my guest. Adam is the CEO of the International Medical Robotics Academy based out in Melbourne, Australia. Adam, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks AJ, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome, pleasure's ours. We've been trying to schedule this for a while. I'm really excited that our schedule is fi finally aligned and we, we were able to make this happen. Adam, um, I'd love to start with a kindred question. You're another American like me in Australia. Let's bundle this with your background and how you ended up in Australia. Yeah, it's a good uh, it's a good story. I have uh, had a lot of good fortune in my life, and uh, I started my professional career post military uh, with Johnson and Johnson and worked for Medtronic for a number of years, almost thirteen years. And my last stop was in Australia, so uh, I spent about a year and a half here. Fell in love with the country. Uh, but got recruited to go work at Intuitive Surgical. I spent eight and a half years as a VP of sales for the Western United States there. And uh, uh, through personal opportunity, I uh, had the opportunity to come back to Australia. And uh, I got here in January of 2022. I was on the ground for just uh, a matter of about a week. And uh, Professor Tony Costello, our founder, contacted me and said, hey, I heard you're in Australia. And uh, with your background in robotic surgery and uh, the medical industry, uh, would you be interested in coming and running our country, uh, company uh, down in Melbourne? And uh, absolutely great fit, great opportunity to work with uh, one of the sort of founding fathers of, of robotic surgery in this part of the world. And uh, happy to, to be here. And, and so I, I uh, took on the position of CEO of Imra Surgical or the International Medical Robotics Academy. Uh, in uh, in April of 2022. Thanks for that background, Adam. Um, I know many of us, especially uh, US-based or Europe-based, uh, know about Professor Tony Costello, but maybe for the audience just in general, I mean, would you just sort of share Professor Costello's background and what his sort of, um, what he's been giving to the robotic surgery education over the last couple of years? Yeah, absolutely. It's a big, long story. I mean, Tony's known as an innovator in the space. He was uh, a very um, uh, energetic young surgeon who uh, did fellowships in the United Kingdom and as well in the U.S. at MD Anderson in Texas. He uh, was one of the pioneers of early laser treatment in uh, urology and uh, advocated for that minimally invasive surgery with laparoscopy in urology, which not many surgeons really did at the time. That was in the, uh, the, the early 90s. And as robotics came around, he had worked with a lot of his colleagues in the U.S. and around the world and uh, lobbied on behalf of, um, of the surgical community here to, uh, to, to bring a uh, a robotic platform to Australia in 2003 at uh, the Epworth Hospital and has since been blazing trails. I think before he retired, he completed about 2,500 robotic cases, but has been published hundreds of times. He's a former uh, professor emeritus at uh, uh, the University of Melbourne Medical School and uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital Department of Neurology. Just an absolute innovator. He started IMRA with the idea that surgeons should teach other surgeons. And um, you know, he felt that uh, it's an opportunity for the societies in order to lift robotic surgery to the standard of care. Uh, it's going to require the societies and governing bodies to step up and, and say, this is how you should train a surgeon. And that shouldn't be left just to the device industry. Um, it's a burden that they, the device industry doesn't really want to bear anyway. And um, it's, it's an opportunity to have surgeons teaching surgeons and scaling that. So he went to the Victoria government he was able to get some funding to build out a world-class facility in North Melbourne, right near the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and uh, and then COVID hit. And so, uh, you know, as Melbourne, many people are aware, was locked down for a long period of time. That impacted the early start to the company. And uh, and then they took it from sort of a nonprofit to a for-profit company in, uh, in 2022, and uh, that's when I came on board as the leader. We built out a, a really good management team. And we've since sort of kept the core of what we're all about, surgeons leading other surgeons, developing multi-platform agnostic surgical education content, which we think is needed particularly. And I know 
with the Mullins Group, you know, you're aware of the 40 different companies coming out and soft and hard tissue robots. It's it's going to be an, a, a robot world in the future, and uh, and so that the hospitals are looking for you know the opportunity to uh, have multi-platform agnostic credible surgical education, which we provide on behalf of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. We're working really closely with the Royal College in Ireland and other colleges around the world. Um, as a part of this, you know, when I was at Intuitive, uh, there's a real big push to move away from live animals and to move to a more ethical way to train surgeons, but in a progression-based model where you can uh, help the surgeons get better outcomes in a more cost-effective way. And that's when we really started to double down on the research to develop the chemistry to make synthetic organ models that react like real human tissue. So, for example, they they react to surgical energy and cautery uh, just like real human tissue. They You can suture them, you can staple them, um, and, and they also have all of the anatomical correctness of real human tissue as well. So uh, IMRA really is founded by Prof. Uh, Cathello, um, but has evolved to this uh, global surgical education and training company that provides very realistic surgical models and the surgical education to go with it. So it's a very symbiotic relationship with one another. Yeah, Adam, um, and I, I definitely wanna double down on some of those aspects, especially the uh, the synthetic models. Let me, let me start with sharing with the audience. I had the privilege of coming to visit your site early this year, and it is absolutely spectacular, right? Um, and and look, I mean, you know, with the intent of being an educator, a pioneer like Professor Costello has been, but to to transform that into an education center, world class, and obviously having seen it myself, um, it it really is spectacular. But I'd love to know more about how the model has been evolving, specifically on the education front, right? Um, in Australia, are surgeons within Australia coming to your site and then in getting programs and education? But then how does that model also evolve outside of Australia? Yeah, that's a really uh, exciting question for us because this is uh, we're sort of in the middle of this transformation as, as it is right now. As I mentioned, we started as this Australia-based or training for the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. And um, so surgeons come in, we do online education courses. We've got a Foundations of Robotic Surgery uh, series of courses that's accredited by the college. We do in-person courses we call uh, uh, RoboSet, which is an in-person two-day course uh, with human factors, practicing uh, all kinds of simulation exercises and then ending up practicing on, on real tissue. We do assistance courses. And all of this, and we uh, initially, you know, thought maybe we would take that this brick and mortar concept around the world. But what we realize is, with synthetic models um, from uh, our, our business, we're able to take our content and our pedagogy, and we can do this training anywhere there is a robot because the uh, the content is sort of universal. And can, um, you know, the synthetic models allow you to take it uh, to, to do anywhere in any operating theater theoretically could become um, a surgical training center. And so, uh, you know, animal tissue, cadaveric tissue, you, if you use that on a for human use robot, you can never use that robot again for a human. So a hospital wouldn't want to do that. Um, but what we've been able to do is partner with folks like Liverpool Hospital in Sydney and Macquarie University Hospital um, in Sydney, guys in St. Thomas's Hospital in London, uh, the RCSI in Dublin. Uh, we're running a course there this month in November. We're working with the University of Freiburg in Germany uh, to run courses. And so uh, surgeons come in, they, you know, go through it sort of a train the trainer day. We go through. Uh, all kinds of educational content, and we can take the training to the surgeons wherever they are. So they don't have to travel, they don't have to fly to an animal lab or to another tissue lab, and they get a really high quality training experience, and the feedback's been absolutely, um, you know, fantastic. Yeah, and Adam, you previously mentioned, and of course, this is something that is is sort of um, the nature of robotic surgery in the industry at the moment. There are not just uh, 
companies like Intuitive that are have been around and have been leading the charge for many years, but very exciting companies, CMR, Moon, you know, the list goes on. You've got tremendous players coming out of Asia. Um, SS Innovations, you know, is, is a, another exciting company that we, yeah. the Mullings Group, follow. Um, I have got to ask, because this was my question when I visited your center as well, H how do you stay, and this is probably a double-edged question, right? How do you stay agnostically, rel well, agnostic yet relevant with all these systems coming? I mean, what's your sort of industry partnership that allows you to have some of the best systems at IMRA? The, you know, I would say the biggest thing that we think about at IMRA is that robotic surgery is the future. It's not only the future, it's the present in many, many parts of the world. Having seen firsthand how surgeons have embraced and hospitals have embraced the benefits uh, clinically, economically, um, you know, around the world, we're seeing this explosion. Uh, we expect the robotics market to grow on average about 17 to 18% uh, per annum over the next, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years. It'll accelerate and become the standard of care through most of the developed world. And I, I believe that's why you see J&J &J and, and Medtronic and, you know, SS Innovations, as you mentioned, CMR. Uh, all of these companies, and, and there are many, 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 many more to, to, to list. What we try to do is we believe in the power of robotic surgery, and we think that there, you know, each robot will have certain things that will add value, and that's not for us to decide. That's for a hospital to decide. That's for a surgeon to decide what robot they choose. We don't want to influence uh, any part of that. We want to work and collaborate with all of the robot companies, and actually the laparoscopic companies as well. Um, with our with our models, because we think there's significant value that can be created for them in scaling their training offerings uh, in addition to uh, to what they're currently doing. So the best answer I can give you is we work with all of them. We believe deeply in what we're doing in robotic surgery. Uh, it is the future. Um, anyone who doubts robotic surgery today is really, I think, uh, living in a fantasy land of of uh, you know not not believing in gravity at this point, and so uh, you know we'll continue to see this this movie play out over time. There are incumbents with uh, dominant positions, but yet I think there's still room for a lot of uh, the different companies to come out, and uh, you know some of them will get picked up for their intellectual property. Some of them will have strong commercial launches. Uh, others will falter and, and fail, but innovation is a good thing. Competition is a good thing in the space. And at the end of the day, you know, um, and this is a really important point, is early on, maybe 2012, 2013 timeframe, you know, people were thinking, will there be a hospital with uh, a robot in it? You know, will there be a robot in every hospital? And and the, I think the calculus has changed a bit. Now it's, will there be a robot in every operating room or theater across the developed world. I think that's a much more likely scenario to play out. And, uh, and, and we're seeing that, you know, all around the world at the, at the moment. You, uh, you actually triggered a question which, you know, may or may not be part of the Emra model or may be part of the Emra model at some point in the future. But, um, you know, you use the word developed market or developed region. And as you know, and I know from our background at Medtronic and various places, that nomenclature developed changes often. Um, what used to be BRICS back in the day, then developing countries, then emerging markets, like the regions yeah. are always changing, right? Um, but Adam, I'm curious, as more and more surgeons attend the IMRA curriculum, do they ever ask you for advice on how to actually get robots into their systems? I mean, I, I imagine that's a big question for people, especially in hospitals with funding constraints. Yeah, it is. And, and it's um, uh, it's something we, we would typically refer them back to the device industry to, to sell the robotic platforms for them. Uh, you know, there's a lot of clinical literature out there. You know, there are more than 25,000 peer-reviewed articles on the value of robotic surgery and the clinical and economic, you know, and societal benefits of it. Um, so, you know, typically we'll refer them back and, and have them connect with the device industry who can help them uh, create a pro forma and an offering. Um, but selling robots is really, you know, largely a case of you need surgeon champions. 
You need people who believe and advocate for what the robot will do. Uh, the clinical advantages, um, most importantly, obviously the economic advantages, the, the physician advantages, um, you know, as, um, as these, you know, we are seeing more from parts of the developing world, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, customers reaching out and asking questions about either setting up educational programs there or just setting up robotic programs in some of these markets in our part of the world. Yeah. Um, so this, this is kind of where I was going. Do you foresee IMRA hubs? I mean, is that, you know, is that potentially a strategy or how do you, how do you see the IMRA model evolving over time? Yeah, I do. I, I think there's enough demand that, uh, and we've seen some other organizations do this as well, uh, but the market's going to get very cloudy um, with all of the competition coming onto the market. I think hospitals are looking for solutions. Colleges of surgeons are looking for a solution that's credible, um, but yet also has a proven, um, uh, you know, credible uh, training model. Um, uh, IMRA will certainly be one of a host of companies who can potentially do that. And, you know, we think we can do it as well or better than anyone because ours is more scalable because we use a really advanced synthetic models and, uh, and we will have a different locations all around the world. And we're currently, you know, working with colleges, as I mentioned, and different universities and um, at least uh, five countries at, as we speak and soon to be uh, into the US. So Adam, before I have one more question on, which I think I, I was pretty excited to hear about before, I, I wanna learn more about the, uh, the Pindari product line and the synthetic strategy there. But uh, tell us about being affiliated with hosting SRS. I mean, that was that's a huge milestone, and especially with the fact that coming out of the COVID, you know, bubble, um, and SRS being outside of the U.S. What, what was that like to be part of SRS? Yeah, we're so appreciative of the uh, the support that we got from Dr. Vip Patel um, and the the board of the SRS. Uh, they put uh, Professor Costello on the board of SRS as well. Um, there's so much action happening in China and in Asia. Uh, Japan is exploding with uh, Hinatori and Intuitive Surgical and their platforms there. Medtronic's done well there. Um, you know, we'll continue to see that growth in Korea and Japan and all of these, these markets. So Dr. Patel was really looking to take SRS offshore for the, only the second time in history. And they, they brought it to Melbourne last year. Uh, we had a very good attendance. It was really remarkable. Melbourne in the wintertime is, uh, is you know, uh, not as warm and tropical as, as it is in the summer for sure. But uh, we had, uh, I want to say, over 800 in-person attendees and another, I think, 500 um, on the phone. We were happy to be a part of it, and we'll continue to support SRS um, over time. Next year, I believe SRS is going to be in Europe, and um, and we look forward to attending that one as well. Yeah, that that that's just such a milestone event, and just um, for partnership with Imra too. I, I think that's just just a phenomenal occurrence to happen. Um, Adam, I'd love to learn more about the Pindari strategy. So for the audience, Pindari is obviously your synthetic product line. Um, initially, when I saw it, first of all, I was just blown away by the accuracy, the authenticity. I mean, I started my career as an Ethicon operating room sales yeah. rep. Um, transition into Valley Lab for a little while. And the fact that I could actually see, smell, sense the cautery effect on your synthetics was just was just mind blowing to me. But prior to that, how did that strategy evolve? I mean, I, I understand the whole, um, you know, the need for non cadaveric uh, you know, uh, training models and stuff like that. But specifically for IMRA, how did that idea germinate? And then where are you today with it? Yeah, initially, it was Prof's idea to, to not bring animals into our training center. And he wanted to do it with synthetics, but one problem, there weren't great synthetics to use. And so we've looked at a lot of them. Um, uh, the, the industry is growing very, very fast. There are a lot of companies trying to do this, but uh, we've really invested in the science and the, the, you know, the chemistry that's required to make tissue react like real human tissue that you can form and look like real human tissue through, um, you know, a variety of techniques. Um, 
it, it's evolved from a couple of models to now a whole portfolio of models. And we're working our way, you know, from sort of deep in the pelvis all the way up through the foregut. And we'll be doing lung models and breast models in the future, uh, orthopedic models, um, you know, virtually every part of the body that can be um, recreated. And, and this is an important thing that I try to explain to people and, and particularly our investors is that we're not trying to recreate the human body. What we're trying to create is the right fidelity of a model that meets the needs of what a surgical learner needs to learn at that time and practice on in a repetitive way. So we use a class model, a class system, just like whitewater rafting. Our models come in class one models all the way up to class five. So class five being more advanced, uh, uh, class one being very simple. And so you, the surgeon would start on a basic task, like a class one model, and they would advance all the way up. The other thing that we try to do is we said, well, how do we create a true experience, not use the dome uh, trainers that people have used for years, you know, and in some ways, particularly with robotics, so much of robotics is on port placement philosophy and figuring out, you know, where your anatomy is. And so we said, hey, look, what if we created a synthetic torso that looks in and has all of the anatomical correctness of a real human torso? And, uh, and so we'll send you some uh, videos and some different things of some of our new product launches, our Project DadBot launch, which is uh, uh, a, a sort of average uh, uh, male, uh, very familiar with a lot of people's body type, um, uh, so slightly obese and uh, um, very reflective of what you'd see. But inside that torso, uh, you put the single-use um, uh, models in there. And again, these are meant to be used one once or twice. Um, and then they're discarded uh, ethically, um, bioinert materials that can be disposed in the rubbish. So there's some practicality there for both the medical device industry and hospitals who are training surgeons. As I mentioned earlier, you can sort of make any hospital um, a training center, if you will. Um, and then this torso is reused hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, the skin is a material called synthetic. And uh, after you put ports in it, you can pull the ports out and you can heal it um, very quickly and easily. So the next surgical learner has an opportunity to have a, sort of a virgin abdomen experience to put ports in and figure out where their, their uh, port placement should be. And that was the realism and the right fidelity that we wanted to create for the surgeons. Adam, if it's okay with you, because I've visited um, and I've met some of your team members, I'd love for you to tell the audience, um, I mean, you design it at the IMRA facility, you, you manufacture at the IMRA facility, correct? And, and some of the talent behind the Pindari line, if, if you don't mind sharing, because I think that that is a killer story as to the people behind that product line. Yeah, it's, there's, it's, a, it's credit to them, right? I mean, they are so bright and brilliant and dynamic. Uh, we've got... Uh, uh, First, uh, I think one of the people who kind of put us on to this is Professor Andrew O'Connor at the University of Melbourne, um, very influential in us and, and Professor Costello with this idea. And then that evolved to hiring Grace Burke, who is one of our lead designers. Um, she's, uh, you get a chance to meet her. She's absolutely brilliant with understanding anatomy and physiology and creating these models. So they're, they're very lifelike. Um, and uh, we had hired a PhD postdoc chemical engineer uh, from the University of Melbourne, Dr. Courtney Evans, uh, to come on board. So we brought her on. We brought a modeler to design the uh, the uh, the torsos, if you will. Um, from he's from Hollywood film industry. He'd done movies like Blade Runner and things for The Lord of the Rings and different projects for a twenty year career in in that industry. And so we've got uh, uh, you know mechanical engineer. Um, from India, who, who's amazing. You know, we've got now we've about 17 employees on the team already and continuing to grow and expand each month with more people. Uh, we really are just looking for super talented people who are passionate about eliminating the need to use pigs and cadavers in the future. And and uh, and people are coming on board for this wonderful experience as well. So, um, you know, we're very blessed with a, a talented team and we'll continue to innovate. And we're launching two new products, as a matter of fact, right now. 
Um, we hired a head of product development, Carol Anthony, and uh, he has been really helpful in, in driving this innovation culture, the innovator die culture here. And, and so uh, we launched uh, the dad bod, uh, we launched the inguinal hernia. It's a what we call a class four inguinal hernia model. It's a bilateral inguinal hernia uh, with a direct and an indirect defect on it. It's unlike anything ever been created. Um, there's no need to practice an inguinal hernia on a cadaver ever again now that this model's out. And we'll continue to make uh, that more advanced over time. Uh, you know, we've got colon models and we've got a gastric model for surgical stapling that we just introduced at the If So conference that was in Melbourne last week. Ventral hernias and, uh, you know, staple pads and the colon resections and uh, kidneys and uh, you name it. We, we can sort of create everything uh, in the body. Yeah, you're, uh, you're actually taking me back to my Ethicon days when I still remember the very first time I had to demo uh, a, a hernia mesh and then actually being in the operating room where the surgeon got to that dissected defect and asked me, is this where I put it? And, and uh, how do I put it? And, you know, back then we, we never had options like this, right? And um, just I remember when I came to visit Imra and I saw some of your models, I was like, man, imagine sales rep training too at the industry level um being able to do this oh, as opposed sure. to us going from you know just porcine models and cadavers if if some of the companies even had it oftentimes we were just textbook learning and then in the operating room right so yeah this is fascinating um adam where all is are your pindari models commercially available or how how do surgeons or institutions order them yeah, they just can contact us uh, through our website, and uh, we are selling right now in uh, Ireland, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, the United States, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, obviously, Southeast Asia. Uh, but we're scalable globally. We plan to launch in the Middle East later this year. Um, if you come to our website and just inquire um, or email me personally, I'd be happy to to follow up with you. Um, we do custom innovation, but more importantly, we have off-the-shelf products that are fantastic and should meet the needs of, of, of industry and as well academic institutions, training surgeons. Yeah, fantastic. Adam, um, because the Mullings Group, and you know this, right, um, we are heavily focused on talent recruiting. Um, and really what we're very passionate about is a... Uh, an emerging company story when it comes to people and growth. I'm very curious about Imra, you know, what has been the growth story in terms of the people that you've hired and, and where all internationally do you have Imra team members? We uh, are about to add a U.S. Uh, expansion. So we have um, uh, our president of the Americas, Mark Grant, um, from a long career at Medtronic. He's our chief commercial officer and has been with the company now for over a year. Uh, we're about to expand into uh, Europe and, uh, and giving him more headcount in the U.S. Uh, we're also looking at some creative agreements and arrangements potentially to distribute the products um, in a variety of countries around the world who have expressed interest uh, in distributing the products. And so uh, most of the talent, as we discuss, is in Melbourne. Um, and in Australia, uh, but that's going to change dramatically over the next 12 months or so as we continue to expand and, and uh, get a foothold in, in other markets. Fascinating stuff, Adam. Um, you basically addressed, you know, I was, I was very curious what the next 12 months or the next 16 months look like for you, um, which you've addressed with expansion. I've also decided that I'm going to buy one of your dad bods and just to make sure that I don't look like that. So it's going to be an inspiration for me. Um, but Adam, I wanted to say thank you. This, this has been fascinating. Ever since I visited, I've been wanting to get you on just so that I could share the Imra story. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Tony Costello. I had the pleasure of getting his textbook, which I occasionally read and, and try to make sure that I stay up to date. But um, I think your story, your organization is just fantastic. And seeing Pindari, I mean, that that really added a whole nother layer. Like you said, I've been at events where I've seen synthetic models now coming out. 
but having actually been able to play with the Pandari, you know, set up when I was visiting, just really made it very real. And I think when I met your Hollywood modeler, that just brought it all together for me. Um, so Adam, I just want to say thank you. This has been fantastic. Anything you want to share about Imra the next year? I mean, what's exciting for you? Yeah, look, what's exciting is continue to to partner with the medical device industry and these academic and uh, society bodies. Um, we continue to do research. I think one of the things that differentiates us is that we're clinically validating both our training courses, but also the models that go with them. And so it's a complete offering that's validated with clinical literature and supporting materials. And, you know, that's going to be essential because there is a tidal wave of growth that's taking place. You know, there's transition happening away from live animals. Um, one of the things that we're inspired to do is provide a more ethical and cost-effective and sustainable way to train surgeons in a, in a modern way. And the thing that I'll, I'll leave with you is, you know, our goal at IMRA is to eliminate the need for live animal training within the next five years completely in the developed world and uh, to eliminate the need to use a cadaver for surgical education and training in the next 10 years. I, I believe that through industry and, and all the innovation that will come out, these are really realistic goals and we're excited to be on this journey. It's going to be a better way to train surgeons, a more modern way to train surgeons. and um, in the end, you know, patients will benefit from, from this hard work. So that's the most important thing. That's what drives us at IMRA. Thanks so much, Adam. And uh, to everyone listening, definitely check out the International Medical Robotics Academy website. Um, their education programs are on there. The Pindari product line, the synthetic product lines on there. Absolutely fascinating business. Adam, the Mullings Group is really excited to partner with you and watch your journey. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being a guest. Um, it's been an absolute Thanks pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.